Cuma di musim Ini bisa Gimana ya?
note address. I have one of those best practice moments. And as you know, today is a conference on best practice in management education. If you look at your delegate kits, uh, there is a conference booklet and brochure there. And towards the end of the book, I think it's the second last page, you will find the conference document. And I know my friends at uh, Nolscape, our academic partner, have done a brilliant job in putting together this paper. Unfortunately, my printer forgot to include it. So what we will do for you is uh, we, will circulate, uh, we will circulate copies of this document, hard copies to of this document to you. Um, and hopefully by this evening, uh, you should all have it in your email inboxes, in color. Um, it's a good document, and you will get it. I apologize for this. Um, hopefully, it won't happen again. There won't be any other best practice moments today. Uh, so quickly, let's move on to the uh, let's move on to the beginning of the program. Welcome to this uh, uh, IMA Management Conclave on best practices in management education. I think there's a lot to be said, a lot to be done, a lot to lot to listen, look forward to today. Uh, we've got an excellent array of speakers. Uh, both from uh, from the academic world and from uh, from industry, and I think uh, in any in any uh, conclave such as this, we need to be listening to each other. Management, education, services, industry. Industry has certain expectations from those that provide management, and I think this is a good forum uh, to listen to what uh, each of the respective sides have to say, uh, and then move forward from there. So. Um, let me welcome Dr. Raj Agarwal to deliver the uh, uh, short welcome uh, address. Uh, he, Dr. Raj is from Delhi. He's a colleague of mine from IMA, uh, and he heads the All India, sorry, the, uh, the uh, Center for Management Education, which looks after all our management education activities and uh, products. Dr. Raj? Thank you, Jairaj. Good morning, all of you. So this uh, first uh, Professor David Winston, Emeritus Professor of Marketing in CRD. My friend, Dr. Hari Krishna Smaram, CEO Imperial College of Business Studies. Uh, Sir Professor M. R. Rao, he has also come and joined. Uh, distinguished academicians, industry leaders, people from media and delegates to this management conclave. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome you all to this management conclave on best practices in management of education organized by IMA Bangalore Center in Bangalore. As we are aware that current pace of development characterized by liberalization, technological development, and changing social ethos has made it imperative for the Indian business to become more globally competitive. Consequently, the relationship between economy and business management has changed considerably. The demand for skilled and talented manpower in all organizations in social, economic, and public service activities is increasing sharply. These developments have further strengthened the notion that management is a true profession like medicine, engineering, law, cost, and chartered accountancy. Current management education is scientific, socially responsible, structured with defined code and conduct for their professionals. We have seen that in last two decades, the management community, now represented by corporate leaders, managers, vice chancellors of universities, including private universities, dean and directors of management institutes, students, business advisory councils, management associations, regulatory and corporate bodies. As we know that quality management education provides a competitive advantage in a form of skilled workforce 
intellectual contribution and general business knowledge. The contribution of management professionals communities are reflected in rising income level and economic growth of this country. But currently, we see that there is a great diversity among the programs, management programs offered by various universities and management institutes. This, di this diversity is reflected in terms of quality of these programs as well as employability of the institute, of the students. As management ed education grow and mobility of students and faculty increase, stakeholders, specifically in, this e in these years, are becoming more concerned about the maintenance and assurance of quality programs. As we are well aware that quality of management education contributes to society in more ways than one, beside education, Research conducted by faculty on business practices, organization, market, and environmental environment contributes to an ever-expanding base of knowledge that helps companies to acquire a better understanding of strategies that will ensure their success in a rapidly evolving world. Faculty expertise and often of their students is, is sought by the member of the business community ranging from small firms to technology startups and multinational cooperation for strategy formulation in the market. We are aware that currently India is third largest higher education system in the world. As of now, we, we, we know by this uh, site of this AI city, there are more than 3,500 autonomous management institutes approved by AI city they are imparting diplomas and post-graduate di post diplomas programs. Just as in the developed world, India too has reached a stage where the need to identify quality parameters increasingly felt by education industry stakeholders. The need to stratify quality management institute from the pool of more than these 3,500 institutes is increasingly felt over the years. Such an exercise obviously will ensure that the institute has the necessary instrument and resources for the program to produce management professionals not only, for, not only to meet the local stakeholders' expectation, but these should also be acceptable in global market. Moreover, to the extent that the courses offered would be benchmarked against the international best, best practices as well. The students would get a fair idea about the courses quality against global standards also. It remains me to express my hope that this conclave fulfill its promises by providing a rich and rewarding experience to every participants and by convincing all of you that excellence in management education can be brought by adopting and practicing which have a uh, adopting and practic practicing best management education practices which which should have worldwide acceptance and recognition thank you very much with these words once again i would like to welcome all of you in this gathering thank you very much thank you dr raj I forgot to introduce myself. I'm also Jairaj, so there's sometimes a, a, a um, you know, I have to, s I'm, I'm the lesser Jairaj, and I'm happy that Mr. Jairaj has made it uh, to us. He suggested that uh, Professor, Professor Weinstein start off the proceedings. Um, you do have a delegate pack, and you do have profiles of each of the speakers, so I think it's fairly redundant if I go through, um, you know, all of that information, which is contained in your, in your profiles. Um, suffice to say that uh, Professor Weinstein has an extremely, or an exceptional, uh, and distinguished academic record. Uh, he is an emeritus professor from INSEAD, and I welcome him to deliver the inaugural address today. So is it the keynote address? The keynote address followed by the inaugural and, address. And, and address. Okay. Thank you. So I need to get the file up here.
my wife is very upset at me, she calls me Professor Weinstein. <laughs> so every time I'm called Professor Weinstein, I know I'm in trouble. Uh, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm honored by this, uh, by this uh, uh, event. Uh, I came to India for the first time in 1974 as a young assistant professor with his very first uh, consulting opportunity. I spent three weeks in this country. Since then, I came in and out on various tours. So this for me is a discovery, uh, this conclave, your, your interest. And uh, uh, this is a hit or miss proposition. In other words, I, I was trying to, to, to find out what is it that I can say that would be of interest for you, uh, and what is it that I can say with credibility. Uh, so, uh, so I hope uh, you find an interest in what I have to say. and. Uh, I hope that there will be some questions and answers period uh, that you would be interested. Uh, and uh, let's, let's, let's get going. I, I really will talk about, about my view uh, of this topic, and this is B2B or business to business, uh, strategic marketing education, uh, with one blind spot, and this is, uh, this is India. I don't really know much about business uh, marketing education here, uh, although some of my cases and, and the simulation I, I developed uh, has been used here. Uh, my host is uh, Rajiv from Nolscape. Uh, he, uh, uh, we are uh, promoting the simulation here to business schools, to companies. Uh, so that is really uh, a start for me, and I hope uh, this will this will continue and emerge emerge into something significant. Uh, before before I get into the few slides that I have, I need to give you a, a context uh, so you can see where I'm going. Uh, when I started my uh, doctoral program, sometime sometimes in the Middle Ages, I uh, I was trained by the best. B2C professors in the world. I was at Columbia University in New York. I was working as a research assistant with somebody that many of you probably know, Judd Bichette, who, uh, who is very well known in our field, uh, with somebody called John Howard, who is probably the father of, of consumer behavior, uh, with John Farley, who, who introduced econometrics into consumer behavior, so some of the leading minds, and I was like very, like, like any uh, doctoral student, very fascinated and, and taken by all this. And then I graduated. Um, I published my articles from the dissertation. I was very successful within the limits of, of somebody who has just graduated. And then I decided to move to INSEAD in uh, Fontainebleau. And uh, very quickly, I found myself in executive education classes teaching executives who, um, who, who liked what I did, who liked my teaching, they liked my material, they, they felt they learned a lot, but a comment came back always. This was really great, but my world is a little different. My world of B2B is a little different. We, we, d we are in a very different world. So yes, the co you are saying the concepts are universal, uh, segmentation, positioning, uh, the customer's behavior. Uh, so I'm living here very stimulated and, and, and entertained, but I really don't know what to do on Monday morning because the week we spent was not in an environment that I am familiar with. And I kept getting this back and back and back until I decided after four or five years, you know in the academic world you have to pay your dues, you have to publish before you, before you take a risk and change direction. And four or five years after getting hit by all these comments again and again and again, I decided to, to make a switch and, um, and decided to go into the B2B uh, space, which is a r great risk for an academic. Uh, I'll discuss it later on. And, um, 
And the rest is history because I had a, a blast of a career uh, in, uh, in the B2B space. Um, enjoyed it very much. And uh, now after 40 years in INSEAD, uh, I think I have something to say about, uh, about where this field is going. So let me, let me start. First of all, let's define B2B. It's very important because the, the, the audience here, here, you have some marketing people, some non-marketing people, and I need, to I need to explain why is it that, that, that I think uh, we have the issues that, uh, that I think we have. So let's, let's, try, to, let's try to define it. Uh, when we say B2B, we used to call it industrial marketing. Today it's a little more modern to call it B2B. Um, the, the, the main idea is that your target for your marketing is an organization rather than an individual. And that, of course, creates a lot of, uh, a lot of complexities. In organizations, you have people that are uh, paid to make decisions about you, about you, the marketer. So you have different decision makers. Everyone looks at the decision on a supplier or on a product that they have to buy from you, different perspective. Uh, they also bring in their personalities, their experience, their perceptions, their, their past experience with you and with others. So all this complexity coming in uh, means that you deal with an organization and, and with, with a decision-making process and, and a structure of decision-making with people who have played games, with people, for instance, who uh, who are less, than ra less rational than the housewife going to the supermarket. A lot of research has shown that the housewife going to the supermarket is probably more rational than professionals buying uh, uh, high ticket, uh, large ticket items. And the reason is very simple. The professionals face an enormous personal risk if they make a mistake. Not, the hu not that the housewife is not, is not facing risk, but um, if you bought if you bought something that, that bro brought down the factory to a halt or created a problem, you are personally, you're personally uh, exposed. So uh, people are, are, are having all kinds of strategies to, re to reduce the risk. And of course, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of the, a lot of this creates anxiety and, and people are less than, less than rational. So uh, it is, it, is really a, it is really a fallacy to think that because, because people are professionals, they're a little more scientific or, or systematic. Uh, the, 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 uh, the jury is really back in on that, uh, and uh, we see that they are as vulnerable as human as anybody else. So you don't deal only with one, you deal with a group of people like this, teams that are making a decision, and that's very, very complex. The second thing is uh, in industrial markets or B2B, you can create value in, ma in many, many ways. Uh, in consumer goods, you have a very, very similar way to the market or road to the market for, for your product. You move through common channels, whether it's supermarket, retail, et cetera. Whereas in, uh, in industrial markets, there are all kinds of ways to, uh, to create value and, and today, uh, we get even crazy situations like, like the relationship between uh, a company like, in, like Intel Corporation and the manufacturers of computers where the value is made not by buying the supplier's product and then adding the margin and, uh, and making money that way, but it's by buying an Intel component and then selling and getting compensated from the supplier called Intel. Uh, and if you don't get compensated from the supplier, you will not make money. So the world, the all kinds of ways that, that, uh, that, that, that money is made, and you have to understand it when you market to these types of organizations. The third, uh, the third uh, uh, characteristic is that uh, we're dealing with a lot of management functions that if they are not involved, you will not be able to implement a strategy. Uh, you're talking about R&D, you're talking about manufacturing, you're talking about human resources. Uh, whereas in B2C, the people in marketing are much more autonomous and they can make decisions and implement it very fast. In B2B, you have some time to, to mobilize the whole organization to, to have a strategy, which make, makes it very difficult because you, you, you need everybody's support and integration uh, and all the noses 
aimed at the right direction, the same direction, otherwise the strategy doesn't work. Um, other things, uh, you can go to the market with, with different channels. Uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can differentiate on your relationship where everybody has the same product, then the relationship make, makes the difference and the customer would rather bu do business with people they like. The customer needs the product, but if everybody supplies the product, then the customer prefers the people they like. So, so suddenly this becomes not the marketing of a product, but the marketing of yourself as an organization. Um, then uh, the, 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 the incestuous relationship uh, where, where you compete with, with other companies, yet behind the scene you collaborate with them because none of you can, can achieve, achieve things by themselves in terms of technology, in terms of the costs involved. Um, a lot of negotiation because the transactions are very, very big and, and, and the risk is enormous. So there is negotiation, negotiation, negotiation. Uh, transactions are large and risky, as I said. Uh, the people issue. When you make industrial marketing or B2B uh, strategy, you, as I described, your, organ your target organization, it, it, they are really networks of people that you have to influence. But you also work through your own network of people, your, your, your sales people, your technical support people. So we end up as, a, an, in, as an industrial marketer or a B2B marketer, marketer to be, if you want, a, as a, a director or a scriptwriter for a theater piece where there are actors there and you hope to God that the actors play according to the script that you visualize. And if they don't play according to the script, your strategy doesn't work. Whereas in B2C, you can communicate directly to the end user and, st and drive the whole system through their behavior. Here you depend on two networks of people interacting together. And if, and if your vision and if the, the, the tools you use in order to stimulate these people to behave in a certain way doesn't, uh, uh, if they don't work, then your strategy is simply as good as, as your weakest tool uh, and, and you fail. Uh, then there are other issues uh, that add complexity because of this transfunctionality, the implementation, the getting all these people involved, understanding all the pieces, the critical path of where, where things could go wrong, the leadership issues that, that, that come in. And finally, to, to, to make it all even more interesting, technology has come into to be a player here and disrupt a lot of processes and a lot of habits that, uh, that happened in the past. The funny thing is, if you look at my footnote, is that uh, the majority of transactions in any GDP is, uh, or GNP if you want, are B2B transactions. So here is the context. This is the field that from an economic point of view dominates our lives as, as nations, as individuals. Uh, this is where we need marketing know-how more than any other field. Um, and that's why I was attracted to it. So now let's go into, into what is happening in this field. Many of you have been to business school, so you've taken the courses and, uh, and uh, basic marketing, uh, uh, further marketing strategy courses, etc. And uh, since you've been out of school for a while, let, let, me, let me tell you what is going on. So the first thing you see, uh, and again, I am not talking too much about India because I'm not familiar with what, what, uh, what uh, the trends are here. But the first thing we see is we see that finally business schools start to distinguish between the, the, between the, the term marketing and the term strategic marketing. Somehow, somehow, everything that is involved in sales turned into marketing. The word sales disappeared, and we started to call it marketing. And that, of course, gave us a little more dignity. And, uh, and, 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 and when you ask my colleagues in finance or, or, in, in, or in manufacturing, whatever, what is the marketing department doing? They always say, oh, they, they're dealing with sales. Okay, and that's, that's how all the functions, uh, and, and even in business schools, that's how everyone uh, considers marketing. And, and finally, after many years of battle uh, by my colleagues around the world, uh, we managed to get our colleagues 
and people in a lot of companies to understand that market, what we say marketing, there are really two, two domains. There is the, the domain, the operational domain, or what we call in our profession the marketing mix, which is uh, uh, the activities of sales, of advertising, of promotion, um, things like that. And what we call strategic marketing, which is if you want the R&D of interaction with the customer. In other words, what we are saying is that you have, a, you, have, you have a function called research and development in every company, and that function visualize pro visualizes product specifications, how will they man be manufactured, etc. cetera. And then, the, and then all the physical aspect of making it, delivering it, etc., is done according to that vision and according to those blueprints. But as soon as it reached the factory gate, it became an art, magic. In other words, the, it was not, uh, there was no systematic planning and, and visualizing as to why should it sell. But you see, the people inside the factory didn't care because it, it left the factory, it's out the gate. And what, and what we are saying is somebody needs to also look at the rest of the road between the factory gate and the decision of the customer and try to have a vision about the process, about why will they buy, how will they buy, and lay down the blueprints so that the people who do the selling, the promotion, the advertising, etc., can have the guidance as to what it is that they need to do. Because otherwise, everyone is on their own. Everyone has a, their own vision of the market. Everyone is, of course, pulling their own weight. So that I would call the profession of of visualizing, r and what happens beyond the company, beyond the factory gate, is what we call strategic marketing. And finally, it's, it, it, it's getting recognition and not just being conglomerated together with, with, with all the sales operation, which they are still very you know, honorable and, 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 and respected. But, uh, but this is what not strategic marketing. This is marketing operations. The second uh, trend that we see uh, in, in, again, people developing courses, executive education, uh, seminars, etc., is technology is coming in. Uh, CRM is becoming very, very big. CRM is allowing us to, to work on market segmentation in a way that that nobody had, uh, had even imagined uh, giving companies a tremendous, uh, tremendous advantage over, over their, uh, their competitors. Social networks are also uh, allowing companies to find new ways to communicate to the market. So all these tools that are coming in uh, start to affect what people teach and considerable amount of time is spent in our courses on these tools, not yet connecting very well to strategy. Uh, I may, you know, we may discuss it later on, but people feel that it's, impo it's coming, well, once it was coming, now it's here. Uh, so, now, so now people discuss it a lot. Uh, it is still a little frustrating when you walk out because you don't see exactly where it, how it works, but we know it's big and we know that one day uh, this haze will disappear and, and, and it will be well integrated into our discussions about strategic marketing. Uh, the third thing that is becoming uh, uh, very important in B2B uh, strategic marketing, teaching and education is the importance of integrating with other functions. In other words, you cannot, you cannot be effective in, in educating in B2B marketing without understanding financial consequences, without speaking financial language, without dealing with people in operations, supply chain, technology. You simply cannot do this. Uh, and if you don't do this, you are reduced to the operations, to what is, was traditionally called marketing, which was really the operations. But when you want to move to a strategic uh, level, you have to be fluent in, in all the other disciplines and articulate well and have a good dialogue with them. And that is happening. Things are moving that way very clearly. And, uh, and 
I, need, I think that we have here deans and professors uh, and companies that use those services, and I think you should insist on that in your, in your marketing, uh, your, the marketing courses that you invest in. And the, th and the fourth uh, uh, trend, a very important trend, is uh, something that has started to happen in the last, I would say, five, five years, seven years, something like that. And this is, we start to see uh, marketing educators appreciate that it's not only about content. It's not only about the content of the strategic plan, about the numbers, it's also about leadership, organization design, because it's people who are going to do this. So if you are, so we, if you are a strategist in B2B marketing, you are really a change agent, change, ang change agent. You, you are bringing change and you're asking people to change the way they think, to change the way they behave. So you cannot just simply put together a marketing plan with content, brilliant content, and say, now that I did my job, the, the general manager will worry about implementing. You have got to convince a lot of people uh, about your way, understand where the barriers are, understand the strategy of change, assist your manager's management with it, and, and, and basically lead it, perhaps not be the official leader, but unofficially you are the leader because you have the vision. So you have to understand how organizations change and, uh, and what are the processes that are important. So th those are the four things that I see coming in the content of, of B2B marketing courses, and you can see good segments of those courses starting to emerge uh, with professors thinking about this, companies asking for it. Today, if I, I have a program in INSEAL called Advanced Industrial Marketing Strategy, if I don't spend some time about organizations and people and how do I do this, all these beautiful concepts that you taught me, to teach me when you have people in your organization that have to do it, um, I will get very bad grades or rating uh, out, of my, out of my executive students because they are very concerned with it. And the more, uh, the more we are convincing them about the content, the more they will ask us about the process. So that is, that is something that is happening. Now, in terms of the process of teaching, our process of, uh, of imparting education, um, the one very strong effect that is coming across, and this is like a tsunami across all teaching of management, is the online, online trend. Uh, schools like Harvard Business School, MIT, Stanford, um, INSEAD, and others are coming up with programs which basically democratize the field. Everyone now has access to to, to, to the basic courses. And of course, when everyone has access to basic courses, that puts pressure on the others who are not working online to do an excellent job because now the benchmark is I can sit at home, I don't have to travel, uh, I don't need to invest and I will have access to the same material. And, and, and if, I can be, if I can document that I've done this successfully and I can, I can guarantee that companies will start reverting to um, to uh, uh, certification through online methods that will be credible, that will be tremendous competition to business schools because those programs are becoming uh, better and better. So this is something to, to, to watch and to integrate into our, pl our strategic planning as educators. Second thing that, uh, that, that is happening is finally, uh, it's at the end of my career, but finally something that I worked on for many years uh, is finally emerging with critical mass. And this is the use of, use of, manage of simulations in, uh, in management education. Uh, I started it in the late 70s, uh, developed a, a simulation called Industrat, which is industrial marketing uh, strategy simulation. We used it in INSEAD, it's being used in, in the top schools by my colleagues, it is used in this country, I used it with companies here. Um, it is one simulation, there is another simulation that you might be familiar called uh, Mark Strutt, another is Brand Map, another is uh, 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 
what is it, uh, a marketplace, all kinds of simulations, but there was not yet critical mass. But with more and more technology penetrating into the classroom, finally, faculty is taking the, taking the risk of investing it, learning it, uh, and they get the reward of, 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 of being effective in the classroom. And, uh, and now we have come with the momentum is starting to take place. And the other sector that has woken up to it is companies. Companies are now asking uh, for uh, business schools to, to, to train their managers when they send them to the business school using simulations because they want them to really make mistakes without the company paying, like a flight simulator. I want them to crash a few times and then they should try, my, try it on me. And, and a lot of companies are now waking up and demanding this, so, demand, so this is becoming, becoming absolutely enormous uh, uh, in business school education across, across the board. Two things that uh, unfortunately uh, make me a little bit concerned. One thing is because of the fascination uh, with technology, the continued uh, ease of research in, in, in B2C by faculty uh, because of the availability of data and the, the, the need to publish and, uh, and the fascination with, uh, with social media as in general, we see less and less B2B cases written. And you cannot simulate everything. You, you, need, you need cases, you need, to, you need to put students and managers into the shoes of companies and replicate the type of dilemmas that people had in order to give them, the, give them a diversity of experiences, which a simulation doesn't do. A simulation gives you a very deep experience, but not diverse. Cases give you the diversity. And here, the stream of, uh, the stream of cases has slowed down. So that's a concern. That's a concern because, as I said in the footnote to my very first slide, the majority of the, of the GMP is B2B. So we are, now get, we are now sliding into a situation where the demand for B2B education is very, very strong, yet uh, business schools are, are, or business school professors are converging on, on B2C, which, which is going to create a problem because we will be using old cases. Uh, the group of faculty who really will be experts and knowledgeable on B2B will shrink. Of course, those who stay, like I did in many years, we are very much in demand and it's great to be in demand, but, uh, but, but industry is uh, industry needs uh, needs a supply of, of faculty in B2B. And uh, so that is the concern that I have. And finally, thank you. And finally, uh, it is still, it is still the, uh, the most exciting field because of its complexity, way more complex and way more stimulating than, than B2C, I think. Uh, Excellent work is done there. Uh, companies need it. And uh, I hope that a few thoughts here uh, provoke perhaps some thinking by, by business school faculty and, and, and leaders here uh, to see whether, whether you can build up to the demand of your clients who are sitting, sitting right in this room. So thank you very much. These, these were my thoughts. And if I didn't, if I didn't overrun my time, I will entertain a few questions. Yes. I think we'll do the questions at the end. Great. Um, yeah. That okay. works. Okay. They don't refer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Uh, I think uh, it's very interesting that this, the this uh, subject matter, uh, is approached from a, a pure marketing point of view. I think it throws out some interesting questions and challenges. Uh, I'd like to introduce very quickly Mr. Jairaj. Uh, many of you know him. Uh, he is um, one of India's leading administrators. Um, he's been involved in the management universe uh, for a long, long time, uh, particularly with IMA as a past president. He also has um, 
a very distinguished academic record uh, with degrees from both Princeton uh, and Harvard. More about Mr. Jaraj in your, in your uh, conference document. Please, sir. Can I close this? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, my apologies for uh, coming late. Two factors were responsible. One entirely exogenous and the other lack of planning, both of which you eschew in management education. I'm very excited to be here because uh, basically when I discussed it with Mr. Daniel, when the idea took place that we must have a conclave of management educators, I felt that what we really wanted was a forum to debate and discuss about what we mean by quality management education. That was also alluded to by Pro Raj Agarwal. And there are more than 200 business schools in Bangalore itself. Uh, in India itself, the number of business schools are more than three and a half thousand. Some say it's as many as 5,000. So what I had suggested to Aima, Bangalore, was that we should have a brainstorming of management educators. And I'm very happy to see Professor Anuradha, Professor Manohar, and uh, other, Professor Vardhan, Dr. Vardhan, and also very distinguished people here. What we wanted to do was to get people together, brainstorm, and discuss about some contemporary issues in management education. What are these issues? And I'll be very brief because we are running out of time for this uh, session. There are actually five themes we wanted to discuss, and we have brought it out in the sessions in one way or the other. The first is, how do we make the MBA program contemporary and relevant? And I'll speak a little more about it as we go along. The second is, what kind of skills and attributes are required in the managers of the 21st century. Because there's a strong and dominant criticism that what management education does in India is to really equip uh, people with static skills. Now those are not important because there's so much of change, there's so much of uncertainty that you know, what are management educators doing to, to really put things in perspective? I'm happy to recognize Professor Rao also. Good morning, I'm sorry I didn't see you earlier. The third is equally important, which is to what extent are, uh, is this management education provide, providing an ethical base for tomorrow's manager? And I don't have to go into the issue of ethics in great detail for you because it's quite relevant and fresh in our memory. And I'll say a little more about it as we go along. The fourth is in the wake of technology and all the changes that have come about, in the context of social media and communication and so on, how does the manager of tomorrow look at his or her role uh, shaped by and shaping technology? And finally, what are the best practices in the wake of all these developments in management education? And what can we provide as AIMA to our management educators in one forum? Obviously, this is a very tall order and a one-day conference of this kind cannot exhaustively discuss these themes. But I think that uh, if we can approach this subject and if we can provide some inputs through the various sessions that have been brought about, then this is more than worth it. There is a prevailing view, and you see it in literature today, that management education is not necessary, that it is basically an add-on because what you are doing, really, in the top business schools is to get outstanding talent, academic talent, put them through a rigorous two-year program, stamp and certify them, and send them out to the real world. So since there is no value added of any kind, much the same criticism is also there for the IITs and the IIMs. There is no such uh, separate niche for management education. It will be interesting to have your views as to whether this is a valid point or not. But the second is more important. The second criticism to which all of us must be sensitive 
is that you know management education can equip you with competencies of some kind in accounting in uh, finance in od and so on but does it really equip you with leadership uh, can you really uh, acquire the essence of leadership in a two year program or is leadership intrinsic without going into this controversy and discussion and debate about leadership i think all of us must reflect as management educators and leaders here as to what is the extent of leadership that really you are providing or equipping or facilitating among today's students i also spoke a little earlier about the moral imperatives required in management education this has uh, been underscored by recent examples in corporate history particularly the failure of great companies like enron and so on where arguably those managers went to the best business schools in the world and yet they were found wanting the most recent example unfortunately concerns a in indian who was an iconic figure like rajat gupta and rajat gupta's story is being repeated every day in the new york times and in all papers what is it that led to rajat gupta's downfall a man who had everything at his uh, beck and call was it greed was it lack of uh, balance or was it simply an ability to distinguish between right and wrong so ladies and gentlemen without taking too much time if i were to uh, specify what the takeaways of this one day conclave is and i would think it may be advisable for us to now plan for a two day conclave rather than a one day conclave and make it very tight and focused the first is that as management educators as those who want to provide the best kind of education for the students your focus will be on needs and requirements which are dynamic for the 21st century and how do we do that within your uh, within your academic environment secondly how do we produce leaders and not just status quoists and thirdly how do we make our uh, 21st century managers humane and humble in the wake of all the controversies that we see around us and finally how what is the role of technology globalization liberal liberalization in the context of the manager and more importantly in the context of the human being i would also like to make a suggestion to the organizers that you know when we have such a wealth of talent here it would be advisable if we have a open session in which we can invite people to also come and speak about these issues and share news and notes and talk about it rather than just listen to speakers so that we can make it more interactive but i am extremely gratified that they have such a fantastic turnout that all of you are here and i'm sure ladies and gentlemen that this is going to be a very rich cerebral experience for all of us thank you very much thank you mr jaraj uh, i've heard mr jaraj speak on many occasions and i've never ever once come away uh, feeling unmotivated i mean he provokes i think all of us to reconfigure uh, a discussion and his his ability to set um, the agenda in context uh, is 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 quite astonishing i wanted to save this for last but he did allude to it this conclave is actually mr jarej's idea um it it uh, it's an idea that we first started discussing in april um it gestated very quickly and this is the outcome of mr jarej's idea i also do want to say that we hope that this is something that we're going to have on a regular ongoing basis and mr jarej's suggestion that we create a forum for discussion um is is really well taken and i think we should find ways in which we can collate uh, uh, these intakes and then uh, circulate it out to a wider audience um i i i hope that um, i'll eat in a little bit into your uh, tea time and have questions um but before that i would like uh, i would like uh, to ask dr maram uh, to conclude the session before we go on to question and answers good morning friends on the behalf of all india management association on behalf of all my colleagues sitting here i would like to express our sincere thanks to mr jairaj 
the former additional chief secretary, government of Karnataka, and our mentor, the past president of All India Management Association, for bringing a wonderful the concept that is the best practices in management education to us. Thank you, sir, for bringing the wonderful program. And thanks to Professor David, who is a colleague of uh, our well-known professor uh, Deepak Jain. We were just, uh, you know, inquiring about Deepak Jain. So uh, giving a, a new concept uh, in the area of marketing that is where is B2B strategic marketing in education going. So it's a great concept uh, to us and uh, new learnings. Thank you, sir, for coming all the way uh, from there to India. On the behalf of IMA and on behalf of all our friends, we'd like to express our sincere thanks. The next is our Professor Raj Agarwal, the Director of Center for Management Education at All India Management Association. He always, you know, think uh, kind of bringing a lot of innovative programs like faculty development program as well as this kind of program which relate to the management professionals. So every month, in fact, uh, one activity from the Center for Management uh, Education keep happening across the country. Thanks, sir, for coming from Delhi to here to meet us. And we also have uh, the resource people, Professor M. R. Rao, uh, whom we are going to uh, listen in a couple of minutes. Then we also have uh, Professor M. K. Sridhar from Knowledge Commission. Then I have a lot of my friends, deans and directors. And I also see our media friends. Uh, Geeta Rao is here, the editor of Education Times. And also Anil Rao from uh, our AIMS Association of Indian Management Schools, Vice President, and a lot of my friends. Thank you for coming here, and uh, hope uh, we'll have a wonderful sessions in coming uh, after tea break. Thank you. Good day. Time to take a few questions. Uh, um, there are people with mics on either side. There were people with mics. Uh, please identify yourself. Uh, just quickly identify yourself and direct your question to a specific uh, member, please. Any questions? A lot of questions, but I'll ask only one. Uh, it's, it's not related to best manager practice, but more about immediate future. Applying technology is a great thing, no doubt about it. We have to go ahead. But as I see the application in various formats, as you said, social media, CRM, and putting everything on the internet, and providing all the material downloadable. In this situation, what we have observed over a period of time in the recent past two, three years, is some kind of a lethargy among the students to enter the classroom. They always feel, now it's available on the internet, why should I go to the classroom? So what do you see in this context, the future of a professor? What will be the role of a professor? And what will be the role of classroom teaching in immediate future in the context of this? You're breaking into an open door. <laughs> uh, we, uh, uh, I think that this is the greatest thing that ever happened to my profession because uh, the mundane practices of simply telling people how the world is, read, read, reading books and, and simply uh, digesting and then and then bringing it to the students. Uh, teaching boring things, okay? All that is going away. In other words, a lot of people can today get into online programs, Google, have access to information. We can all work on the basics on their own, on basically on our own, perhaps with some guidance from, from from some organizations like like IMA who can who can help people improve themselves. But the part which is very complex, the part where you need to bring in your own experience with the world, with companies, with, 
episode, the part where you can help people confront each other with ideas. Uh, the synergy that takes place in a, in, a, in a discussion, in a face-to-face -face discussion, that will never go away. And now the challenge for us as faculty is to, ex is, is to excel in that. So stop wasting time where people can learn on their own and really improve yourself as a faculty member in animating, in, in facilitating, uh, in bringing something that people cannot get in reading books and in media. Uh, this is the, the magic of, 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 of the classroom, the magic of interaction with people uh, and the fun of confrontation and the fun of debate, that will never go away. And I think that we as faculty members have to improve that, improve that aspect.